you've learned a little calculus, you've learned a little physics. Now your teacher is asking you to somehow mix them both, and, and why the heck would you do that? Well, you probably have some idea, but the real idea behind mixing them is this. Not everything is constant. Not all forces are constant. Accelerations change. Mass changes. Stuff happens in the real world. And for that kind of stuff, where not everything is constant, where things are changing, we need to use the mathematics of continuous change, that is calculus. Let me show you what I mean first by a little review of calculus itself. Let's suppose we look at something called the derivative, okay? And that implies something that we know as the rate of change. The rate of change of something is how quickly that thing is changing. It's how quickly the function is changing for each unit of change in x. For example, the rate of change of position is how quickly is position changing, and we call that velocity, right? So let's look in particular at this. Let's find the average rate of change between x equals 0 and x equals 3 of that function x squared minus 4. Now, how do we do that? Well, to find the rate of change, you see how much the function has changed, and then you divide that by how much x has changed, okay? That's the idea right there. That's how you find the rate of change, okay? Not the amount of change, the rate at which it's changing. So, for example, f of 3 minus f of 0 is the change in f of x, and 3 minus 0 is the change in x. f of 3 is 5, that's 3 squared minus 4 is 5. f of 0 is negative 4, 0 squared minus 4 is negative 4, and it's minus negative 4, so be careful with that. Make sure that you don't have this minus sign and then ignore this minus sign. You need them both. And so our answer is going to be, of course, well, that's going to be 9 over 3 is 3. What's that mean? Well, that means on average, the function has changed by 3 units of f per unit of x. Okay? That's its rate of change. It's like if you go 9 miles in 3 hours, you've averaged 3 miles per hour, right? Now, you're typically used to using the idea of slope here, as opposed to when you see something like that. In fact, don't you even think of slope when you see this? If we look at the graph of the function, that's the function of y equals x squared minus 4. Here's at x equals 0. Over here is at x equals 3. So what we're finding here is the rate at which it was changing between here and here. Okay? And sure enough, it was changing by 3 units per unit. That is, if we go over 1, 2, 3 units in the x direction, we go up 2, 4, notice the units over here, 6, 8, 9 units in the y direction. That's all that it means right there. 3 units in the x direction, 9 units in the y direction. Oh, so rate of change is just slope? Well, I would put it the opposite way. I'd say slope is a way of looking at rate of change. Okay? But that's the average rate of change of the function. What if we want to find the exact rate of change of the function at x equals 3? That is, right there. Maybe we'd be looking at a graph that looks kind of like that. It would be touching, but not passing through the curved graph. We'd call that a tangent line, right? So what's the rate of change or the slope of that tangent line? Well, one way to figure it out is to zoom in on this point right here and see what happens when instead of taking a jump of three units, we take a jump of only one unit, or a jump of a half a unit, or a tenth of a unit, or even smaller, okay? So here's what I've done, is I've zoomed in. This is, believe it or not, the same function. Only x only goes from 2.996 over to 3.004, and y only goes from 4.98 up to 5.02. So we have really zoomed in on that point. What do you notice about the graph? We know it's curved, it's an x squared graph. But in that very, very small space, it looks pretty straight, doesn't it? So let's find a rate of change between two very, very close points, one at three and one very close to three. So what is this right here? Well, this up here is f of 3.002 minus, and this is f of 3, and this is 3.002 minus 3. They'll just subtract the x values themselves. 
okay? And so if I choose this point right here and this point right here and connect them with a straight line, this remember is a curve, not a straight line, they would look almost the same and we get a rate of change of approximately six units in the y direction per one unit in the x direction because that is what rate of change means. But what we're doing is we're getting closer and closer. You might say we're taking a limit as we approach three. That's what you learn in calc class. The derivative of a function is the limit as the change in x approaches zero of the change in y over the change in x. Maybe used f of x plus h and f of x over h. But this h right here, or this delta x right here, is what you called h when you were using that way, that method of finding the derivative. So it's the same thing. So what do you have in this particular situation? Well, you know the shortcut for taking a derivative. The derivative of this would be using the power rule 2x, right? And so therefore, f prime of 3 is 2 times 3, which is 6. So if you've been in the habit of thinking of that as a slope, we can now start thinking of it as a rate of change and be a little bit more realistic. By the way, notice how close that answer is to our estimated answer when we were really, really close to three. Okay, so we're using the derivative to find rates of change. So how do we use that in physics world? Well, let's talk about velocity again. We know that it's how fast position changes, right? The rate of change of position. So therefore, since the derivative is the rate of change, right? That's a derivative. So there's where we have it. We take ever decreasing changes in time. Instead of going for three hours, we go for one hour or a half hour or a tenth of an hour or a billionth of an hour. And we say that the derivative of position, x prime of t, is velocity. So what's the rate at which velocity changes? Well, you've had some physics. You already know that the answer is acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So that means that acceleration is that same limit of how fast velocity is changing, that's v prime of t. By, by the way, I could add something to that, and that additional thing would be to say that acceleration, since it's the derivative of velocity, which is the derivative of position, that it's the second derivative of the position vector. By the way, I'm using vectors notation here because we are in physics land now. Think about this as going in reverse. That means that the velocity is the antiderivative of acceleration, and the position is the antiderivative of velocity. So the calculus connections are pretty obvious, at least in this realm, but you already knew that. Let's try an example, but this may not be one that you've done before. Suppose an object's moving in a circle at a constant speed, okay? So here's our object right here. This is its position vector, we'll call that r, where the origin is right here. And let's have the object moving that way, counterclockwise. Okay, find the direction of its acceleration. Well, if you've studied centripetal motion and centripetal acceleration, you know the answer to that question. But let's be very specific about it. Let's suppose that the radius of the circle is 4. And with this point right here is the origin, the equation of the circle in ge from geometry would be, x, would be x squared plus y squared equals 16. Now, that's just the equation of a standard circle. It doesn't show motion in any way. What we have to remember is that x would be 4 times the cosine of theta and y equals 4 times the sine of theta. Why would they be x equals 4 cosine theta and y equals 4 sine theta? Well, let's suppose we draw a little uh, point out here and suppose that our point moved from here to here on the circle. And here's angle theta right here. If I drop a perpendicular along here, okay, then this becomes the x-coordinate of this point right here. And this is the y-coordinate of the same point, right? And as you can see, x here is going to be r times the cosine of theta, because that's the adjacent side, and y is going to be r times the sine of theta, because that's the vertical side. And r, of course, in this particular instance, is 4. Okay, that's the radius. So those are the correct values for x and y. Now, suppose that omega, and what's omega? Well, that's the angular speed 
okay that's how fast it's rotating we'll call it the angular velocity it's technically a vector but we're not going to look at it as such right now is three radians per second three radians is almost half a circle because it's pi radians is half a circle so it'd take about 1001 it would be about over to here and so theta the angle is three times the amount of time that's passed in one second three radians in two seconds six radians and so on okay and so our equation of the position then would be r vector is 4 cosine 3t times unit vector i. I guess technically that should be a hat on top of unit vector i. And 4 sine 3t times unit vector j. Or if you like these cool little brackets here, uh, diamond brackets, 4 cosine 3t comma 4 sine 3t. So that's our position vector. Velocity is the derivative of position. How do we take the derivative of cosine? That's the negative sign. But because it has a function inside of it, we have to use the chain rule. And the same thing over here, the derivative of sine is cosine, but we would have to use the chain rule. And so the velocity, dr dt, would be negative 12 sine of 3t, negative because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and 12 cosine of 3t, the 12 coming from 4 times 3, the 3 coming from the chain rule. And likewise, the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, and so that's dv dt. So again, using the chain rule, we get negative 36 cosine 3t minus 36 sine of 3t, or another way of looking at it is, it would be negative 36 times the unit vector, which would be cosine 3t comma sine 3t. Notice everything's back to positive inside the diamond brackets but the magnitude out there is negative. So let's take a look at these two things. Let's suppose we're at time zero, which was right here at the beginning. The velocity vector has a negative x component, except the sine of zero is zero. So at time zero, it doesn't have a negative component, it has a zero x component. In the y direction, the cosine of zero is one, so it has a positive 12 as its component, what does a vector with a zero x component and a positive y component look like? It means that the velocity vector is pointed straight up. That's our velocity vector. And that's what we would expect it to be because at that location, momentarily, the dot is moving straight up in its path around the circle, okay? What about the acceleration? Once again, if we look at time zero, and let's do that, the cosine of zero is one, 1 times negative 36, the x component would be negative 36. Don't forget, this is still at time 0, so still when the dot is right there. The y component, well, the sine of 0 is 0, so the y component is 0. Now, wait a second, what's that look like? That's the acceleration vector at time 0. Negative 36 in the x direction, 0 in the y direction. Oh, at time 0, the acceleration is that way negative 36 maybe meters per second squared depending on what we had as our distance unit okay and that's what you learned about centripetal acceleration that when an object's moving in a circular path its radial acceleration is toward the center of the circle the calculus confirms that but it does a lot more as you can see it can be very useful no matter how complicated this little vector function might be right here we would still be able to find the velocity and the acceleration. Pretty slick, huh? Let's take a different kind of example. The momentum of an object. We know what that is, mass times velocity. But wait, can't mass change? Can't velocity change? Hmm. Now we're going to need calculus. Varies with time according to the equation below. The momentum is 6 times time to the 0.5 power, that's square root of time, plus time. Find the force. What? On the object at t equals four seconds force and momentum are related well yeah yeah remember the impulse momentum theorem impulse is force times the elapsed time and change of momentum is mass times the change in velocity right so that means if our function has a graph that looks like that we're looking at the rate of change of this kind of function now on this graph this is momentum right here in whatever units it might be kilogram meters per second or something 
and this is time over here on this axis. Okay, so we've got the four second mark on the graph. It's right there. We need the rate of change right there. But I kind of gave away the game. How's it going to be related to that? Well, here's that impulse momentum theorem I was telling you about. Force times delta T, that's called impulse, equals change momentum. But that means force is the change in momentum divided by the change in time. In other words, the rate of change of momentum. Who came up with this idea? Well, it's the same guy who was one of the creators of calculus and one of the most important physicists of all time, Sir Isaac Newton. There's a stamp dedicated to him by the Germans, and it's a hundred something stamp, I guess, Deutschmark or something like that. And right there in the little blue box, you can see the impulse momentum theorem. So, and he had some nice hair too, didn't he? Uh, it was a wig. So that's how you would find the average force between two different times. How do we find the instantaneous force? Of course, force is the rate of change of momentum. So we find the instantaneous force by taking the limit as that time interval gets smaller and smaller. In other words, the derivative of the momentum. That's sweet, isn't it? Now this has to be the momentum as a function of time, but that's exactly what we have. So if I wanna find the force, it's gonna be P prime of T, and that's going to be three times T to the negative 0.5 power plus one. Or if you prefer, three over the square root of T plus one. Well, that's a weird looking function, but wait, we're asked a little bit more. We're supposed to find the, the force on the object at exactly T equals four seconds. So the force at four seconds, I'll just give you the magnitude, so I'm gonna drop the vector symbol, is three over the square root of four plus one. That's three halves plus one, or five halves, or 2.5 in whatever force units we're dealing with. So for example, if the momentum up here is in uh, kilogram meters per second, and the time over here is in seconds, then this force would be in Newtons. So we have another cool demonstration of how we can use the derivative to do some pretty mean physics. Later on, I'll have a video showing you how you can use the integral to do some even cooler stuff. Thanks for watching.